Good morning, Ozark Con. Hope everybody's doing okay today. My name is Virginia in V5F. I'm in Fort Worth, Texas. And I have a talk today about the history of telegraphy. I hope you find this to be something a little different than anything you've heard before. So before we get down to it, a little bit of advertising. This fabulous program is brought to you by the Shack Boob. Aliens with a taste for junk and spare parts. Keep your shack clean and organized with the help of these cute, mostly harmless, semi-legal aliens. Okay, The Victorian Internet is a book by Tom Standage, and it is the inspiration and the heart of this little communications adventure, which will merely scratch the surface of the subject. I read the book in 2011 at the recommendation of a fellow ham, probably because he knew about my fascination with Morse code. However, I can recommend it to anyone. It contains an accessible narrative of the history of wire telegraphy and an insightful parallel narr narrative of the development of the modern internet. And it crosses paths with Morse's contemporaries and their concurrent innovations. When I continued my study of communication technology, I found some surprises and some unexpected connections between this and what we do on the radio to this day. So if you know your stuff, sit back and enjoy it from a new point of view. And if you love radio and CW, see what surprises await you. So when we think of the earliest practical uses of electricity, we might think of something obvious like incandescent light bulbs or public transportation, or maybe even telegraphy. But long before that, in the 1700s, electricity and telegraphy were very separate things. Electricity came first. And in this experiment that predated Ben Franklin's famous kite, French scientist Jean-Antoine Nollier uh, and a group of 200 monks, which were linked by holding 25 foot lengths of thick wire, making a chain of monks over a mile long, uh, performed an experiment where the monk at one end of the line was given a jolt with a battery and it was actually felt all the way down the line by all 200 monks. Later in the 18th century, another fellow in France, Claude Schopp, developed an optical telegraph system which became the means of communication for governments across Europe. It was made up of towers on high vantage points connected by operators with sets of mechanical arms and a spyglass to view adjacent towers. Uh, and these transmitted messages all over the continent with surprising efficiency. And this is actually where we get the familiar designation Telegraph Hill. This system was even considered in North America in the mid 1800s, but by that time, a new form of telegraphy had begun to emerge. So here's a list of inventions that changed everything. One day, a few years ago, I was watching a children's history program and they were doing a segment on the most influential inventions in American history. And as you can see by looking at this list, one of them was glaringly absent. I immediately noticed no telegraph, which the telegraph was responsible for a communication revolution that changed the world. And I was actually upset that it wasn't on the list. So here we are to set the record straight. In my campaign to do so, I found some connections with the inventions on this list and the wire telegraph. And you may think the last two items on the list are out of order, but that's only because I'll finish with radio since it's why we're all here. And it does have the most direct and obvious connection to the original wire telegraphy. This connection to radio also holds a few fun surprises. The photos here are relevant to the list. The first photo there is uh, Thomas Edison, inventor of the light bulb. Uh, the next is Abraham Lincoln. That's actually a photograph of him taken with early photography technology. Uh, the lower left there is ENIAC. And then on the lower right is, of course, Marconi and the radio. 
Here's another interesting list and a good opportunity to get some perspective. Practical use of telegraphy predated the commercially available light bulb by over 35 years. And actually the first attempt at the light bulb began in 1802 by Humphrey Davy. So you can see that in this list, a lot of the, a lot of the great uh, revolutions in technology were uh, far, far ahead of the light bulb there. Morse first heard about the phenomenon of electromagnetism on a sea voyage in 1832, where he met Charles Thomas Jackson, who told him about this, this uh, new thing. The development of electric telegraphy didn't begin in earnest until later in the, in the 1830s by Samuel Morse in the US and William Cook and Charles Wheatstone in the UK. And in the 1830s, Morse was joined by uh, Leonard Gale and Alfred Vail, and uh, Morse did his first successful practical demonstration in 1844 between Washington and Baltimore. By 25 years later, there were Morse lines all over the world. And in these photos, you can see uh, an example of early Morse telegraph equipment which had a solenoid with a moving needle that wrote the code on a paper tape. And then there on the right is the Wheatstone telegraph that was used in the UK. It was a multi-wire system that caused a set of needles to point at a character indicated by the operator at the other uh, end of the line. And um, there are two very different systems, differing complexities in different different ways. Um, and I actually think that the Wheatstone telegraph machine there is, is really pretty. I think it's a lot prettier. The growing demands on the Morse lines necessitated multiplexing, which was made practical by Emile Baudot in France, who figured out how to send five messages at one time with teletype, which led to the telephone in 1876, which was an accident of Alexander Graham Bell experimenting with simultaneous audio signals at different frequencies, all on the same wire. While Bado and Bell were perfecting their new systems, the need for timeliness and ease for telegraph operators led to what we would later call the typewriter. And in this, these pictures here, you can see the original Bado teletype. Five keys were set up kind of like a piano keyboard for the five bit code. Uh, and then uh, here we have a later teletype machine, which of course very much resembles a typewriter. So you can kind of see how this all fits together. And the telephone, forced the invention of the electric microphones, which would not be used for radio broadcasting until about 1907 and not, not used for sound recording until 1925. But the point is to just look and see all the great stuff that we had before the magnificent indispensable light bulb. And next on the list is photography. I can draw a tangent here to Samuel Morse. He did dabble in photography and he became interested in it in 1839 when he was in Paris. This interest makes a lot of sense when you think about it because Morse was actually an accomplished portraitist. He received a degree in art from Yale in 1811 and afterward he studied painting in England and he made his living as a painter in the 1820s. And since I'm an artist, I really liked this one, but we'll have more on that later. Now, this is a really cool one in technology. Did you know that all the multiplexing and fooling around with sending multiple signals and teletype led to the first telefax in 1865? Italian physicist Giovanni Caselli introduced a simple fax service between Lyon and Paris in 1865 with the ability to send simple images 
uh, and it was used mostly for banking purposes to send signatures. This is um, kind of a course precursor to television, digital photography, and of course the modern facts in 1925. So now we're getting into the 20th century which is where we get to computers and the internet. Now we're getting somewhere. The Victorian internet is, is, uh, the, same, is the name of the book that inspired this whole thing. So we hams like to boast and uh, say that ham radio was the first social media and that's not really true, but it makes us feel good. In truth, the telegraph network that developed in the mid late to late 1800s was a true internet, not terribly different from what was created in 1863 by the US, 1963 rather, by the US government and universities with high speed telephone lines and modems. Telegraphers were a very specialized and unique subculture, not unlike the computer geeks of the 60s, 70s and 80s. And they had this little world full of jargon that no one else got. They had social circles and pecking orders and were even plagued by hackers and other issues that we're familiar with today in the internet world, and we'll have more to come on that. Morse code is the first electronic digital communication mode, and in radio, it is the mother of all modes. It's still the most efficient, reliable, far-reaching, and as you all know, still widely used. It's also the simplest mode to produce with nothing but a switch. So before zero and one, we had dit and da, the Morse code system even made the most used characters the shortest ones. The digital uh, mode can be read by a machine, just like the binary code. And ASCII, which is the international standard of what combination is what character in binary. Um, but before ASCII, there was Bado Teletype, which is a binary five bit code, which was king until the computer age. And in fact, the word BOD is our modern term for symbol rate, and it comes from the name Baudot. So just as the internet of the 60s and 70s became more accessible and common to the users of the 1880s, 1980s and 1990s, so the world of telegraphy exploded in its influence by the late 1800s to include more than just the operators. In a long distance information culture full of banking, commerce, and even frivolous social interactions in the form of an ever growing volume of telegrams, which became so numerous that intracity communications in large cities were no longer handled on the wire lest they clog up the system. These proto emails were handled by messengers between telegraph offices. They were even put on city trams or even run through pneumatic tube systems below street level. Yes, those tube things that we still use. Soon short distance telegrams were simply written out by hand and delivered back and forth in rapid succession over the period of a few hours, not unlike text or email does now in just a few minutes. And of course, with all this business taking place came the con artists, hucksters and criminals who immediately surfaced to take advantage of fledgling technology then followed convoluted codes and encryptions and the accompanying privacy rules and commerce laws, and then the inevitable code hackers. Yes, telegraphy had hackers way before the modern internet. But whether it was on the railroad or in the big city telegraph office, the lines were sometimes quiet. And so the ops developed friendships and some of them even fell in love because there were actually a lot of uh, female operators. These were the first online romances. Some operators, as well as other people, were married over the wire in online wedding ceremonies. There was also a little literary genre of telegraphic romances, which became quite popular. My favorite is one called Wired Love, a romance of dots and dashes by Ella Cheever Thayer, which is actually available for free on Amazon Kindle. Check it out. It's pretty good. And of course, there was the genre of telegraph inspired art, poetry, hysteria, fear, neuroses, and spirituality. The modern internet brought us an unexpected brand of information overload, which accompanies feeling so simultaneously connected and disconnected. In the late 1800s, 
a similar occurrence was noted in a world where most news up to that point was weeks old by the time it reached its audience. Daily newspapers were a new thing and knowing what had happened across the world mere days or even hours afterward in a continuous and unrelenting stream was more than many people could handle. It was reported to have caused some mental anguish and a feeling of being generally overwhelmed. So get to the radio part already. Well, I view the part of radio in this story of telecommunication as the world between two internets. The whole point is that it is wireless, more like an intercloud than an internet, influenced by telegraphy, having its own unique culture, which grew right out of telegraphy, since telegraphy was the only way we could use the radio at first. I don't know how many telegraphy texts and instructors will tell us never to read the dots and dashes, never learn code visually, but that is how it first intended was intended to be read. The original telegraph receiver had a piece of moving tape and an ink pen which moved up and down with the movement of the solenoid that was reacting to the signal on the wire. It was intended that the operator would read the tape and painstakingly translate the dots and dashes into the letters and symbols in the message as Morse did here on the tape of his original transmission from Washington to Baltimore in 1844. However, it wasn't too long before operators could send quickly and receive just as quickly by identifying letters by the clicks and clacks of the mechanism, which soon gave way to the sounder, which all of us uh, antique Morse nerds have grown to know and love. And it would be a little while before the continuous wave Morse sound that we uh, are used to would come into use at all. All the sophisticated, um, all the shipboard radio telegraphers at the turn of the 20th century knew only the buzzing signals created by a spark gap transmitter. To us now, this is just noise that would just wipe out the entire HF band. One of the fellows responsible for developing the continuous wave and AM radio transmitting is one we rarely hear about. And he, it's quite possible that Reginald Fessenden, originally of Quebec, Canada, was responsible for the first entertainment radio broadcast of music and voice on Christmas Eve. 1906. The alleged broadcast from the National Electric Signaling Company station in Brant Rock, Massachusetts, contained music played from a phonograph record, a live violin performance, and a reading of verses from the Christmas story using a high-speed AC alternator and a carbon microphone borrowed from telephone technology. Now, whether or not this broadcast took place before the one by DeForest in 1907 or at all, uh, it is evident that Pheasanton was working on and had successfully tested his technology at shorter distances starting in 1902. And he was instrumental in giving us the earliest CW for Morse. And I have to admit being personally inspired by the legend of the Christmas Eve broadcast in 1906, when shipboard operators across the world heard airwaves, which had only ever crackled and buzz, suddenly talking. So now imagine being a wired telegraph op when radio came along and suddenly the clickety clack of the sounder was replaced by a buzzing analog of dots and dashes linking land and sea and a renegade group of folks who threatened to replace you with their wireless nonsense. Of course, radio did not replace telegraphy or telephones, but back then people actually thought it might. There was a gradual transition and sharing of culture and jargon which persists today, including the inception of our protocol and our call sign system. Many of the telegraph offices had two letter codes like XN or BA, the first being the line and the second being the specific office on the wire. So we took our call sign area number and these two letter codes became the suffixes to create our early call sign system in the US. And of course, we have adopted many of um, our CW text codes from these guys. We have, of course, the numeric codes like 73 and 88, which seem kind of random. But starting in the 1850s, telegraphers began using numeric abbreviations to expedite routine communications. And in 1859, these were standardized by Western Union as the 92 code. 
almost all we're left with is 73 and 88, but there's another code we like to use that comes from the 92 code. Look at the number 30, meaning end. Now we use SK and we think it means silent key, the letters S and K, but on the 92 code, the abbreviation for end is the number 30. In old American Morse, the number three is did 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 da did and zero is one really long da longer than the letter T. And you've heard that CW op occasionally end with did did da did da and you think, what a lazy sloppy fist. But actually, he's sending it the old way. The number 30 from the 90, the old 92 code, we changed it to SK. Despite all this evolution of telegraphy, we can proudly lay claim to the Q codes, which I think make a little more sense than the old numeric codes. The Q codes, which were developed in 1909 and standardized by the ITU in 1912 for use in radio telegraphy, are much more specific and certain in, in uh, that they all begin with the same letter as if to say, hey, get ready to copy an abbreviation of something really complicated. And due to this, no country has call signs beginning with the letter Q. There are even groups of Q codes designated for specific services such as aeronautic, marine, and even the ARRL traffic nets. These nets, which were once the backbone of amateur radio public service, along with commercial radio, traffic, and broadcast news, and entertainment radio, this wireless internet did cause a great leap forward in message and media delivery around the world in the time between the Victorian and modern World Wide Webs, becoming a valuable form of social media. And now the same thing is happening again, just as radio took the telecommunication industry a giant leap further in the 20th century, wireless internet and its accompanying devices have done the same in the 21st. As of the last revision of the Victorian internet in 2007, most of this stuff had barely happened. Radio has ever been the magic ingredient that makes for geometric increase in telecommunication and innovation in uh, availability. So more fun culture stuff. Here's a couple more that I wanted to uh, include. Uh, this might even rub us all the wrong way a little. We like to laugh on the air, right? We like to say, hi, hi. And that's the funny way we laugh in CW, right? One of our literal cultural quirks. Now admit you've heard a CW op laugh this way. Did it, did it, did pause, did, did it, did it, did, did pause, did. And maybe thought he's making his eyes weird or he's saying he, he instead of hi, hi. But in olden times, the letter O was did, pause, dit. So he's actually doing this the original way, which was ho, ho. That is how they used to laugh on the wire. And suddenly everything makes a lot more sense. And we all wonder why we've been sending and typing hi, hi all this time. Now we have to admit it, we all feel kind of silly, don't we? And another one of my favorites, why are we hams anyway? I've read several implausible reasons and one that I think is the most likely and here it is. When radio came along and Morse was the only way we could use to communicate, it only made sense for some telegraph operators to make the switch to radio. Wire telegraphers were very proud of their skills and like many other professionals had a natural disdain for hacks and phonies so much so as to have derogatory terms for them. One term we still use today is lid for licensed idiot. Another popular one was plug, which was someone who was just there so that they could uh, plug up that hole in the wire. Um, they could get, get in there in the, in the um, slow office or at, at a, a slow time of day, they would put a plug in there to just keep things going. And another term used back then was ham. This was a ham-fisted guy who lacked finesse in his sending. This is the nickname that followed the perhaps less skilled guys who were willing to fill positions in the new world of radio telegraphy. And voila, soon all those radio operators were hams. There was no distinction in amateur or professional. 
In fact, the term ham is very is fairly rare in the early days of amateur radio. In one of my 100 year old uh, radio magazines, there doesn't seem to be any reference uh, to the use of the word ham for amateurs at all. But it's still a phenomenon, not too uncommon for a group who is labeled with the derogatory term to take it and run with it and make it their own. And so we are all proud hams. If you disagree with this version, please reserve, reserve it for discussion later. And perhaps I will arm wrestle you at uh, next year's OzarkCon. There's a couple more terms which have shifted in their meaning since the early days of telegraphy, not particular to radio. However, I found them interesting enough to include here. We think of having one's wires crossed as wires being switched around into incorrect positions, but a crossed wire is actually a wire that is cut. Getting our wires crossed literally means a failure to communicate as with a cut telegraph wire, which was a common peril and mishap in the early days of telegraphy. Another favorite is the tape recording. Remember the original telegraph receiver? It literally was a telegraph. It made a paper tape of the message, a picture of every dot and dash. Well, if one wanted to record a message or a conversation on the wire, the original mechanism could be employed for exactly that. Just run tape and there you have your tape recording. As I have said, all this just scratches the surface and hopefully inspires you to do your own research into the rich history of telecommunication and electronic technology to see how it all connects and feeds back and makes a rich and wondrous internet of culture and innovation. The Victorian Internet by Tom Standage is a fun read and a great place to start. You can also try some of these online resources. There are lots of options for learning Morse code and getting on the air. There are even online servers where Morse code streams run on multiple channels and people can even communicate via landline Morse complete with clicks and clacks and CW via keys equipped with USB connections. There are also numerous free books and research materials linked from telegraphoffice.com. So I promised a little more on art. Forever ago, when I did all this research, I was really inspired by Morse's original tape on which he wrote out the text of the message, but he also wrote along the edge of, its of it this commemorative proclamation. So being an artist, I took the photo of the tape and some paint and colored pencils and a photo of Morse and made my own commemorative piece. There are two of these suitable for framing signed copies of it in the drawing this weekend, so I hope you win. And as an artist, I love good QSL cards. So if you'd like a unique QSL card or some art for your shack or a logo for your club or a t-shirt or a business card, please let me know. And with that, the Shack Booth and I thank you for your attention today. And now they're headed over to my shack for a little breakfast. If you have questions or comments or materials that bear discussion, please email me nv5f at arrl.net. Thank you very much.